it's the um, Hamptons Observatory for um, allowing us to partner with them for this event. And um, without further ado, uh, take it away, uh, William Taylor. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, it's very exciting to be here today uh, while we're waiting for uh, the, the news from Mars. Uh, it should be around 3.55 that we find out whether the Mars rover uh, Perseverance has successfully landed or not, and we're all praying for the best. Um, I have uh, four big acknowledgements to make today. So uh, one is, of course, to the East Hampton Library for, for hosting this event with us and making it possible for us all to gather and, and watch this event together. Another acknowledgement, of course, is Hampton's Observatory, um, which is the organization I, I work for, and, and, um, and it is a, a group that um, furthers education and uh, astronomy and enthusiasm of astronomy, and it lets us all know when these wonderful events are going to happen in space and on, on Earth to see. Um, I also have to acknowledge uh, Canio's books, uh, which at the very last minute came through and, and provided a, a place and a hosting for us so we can carry this off today. Because of the snow, the internet is down in my house, uh, but they, were, they came through and they helped us out. And um, also I'd like to thank Built Newspaper, which is writing a report of, about this uh, for the German and Austrian audiences. So uh, with that all said, uh, I'll just say a few words about this mission because we're all here both basically just to watch um, as the Mars rover lands. So I won't start, I won't, I won't take very much time with this because we're all very interested in the main event. Um, so the Mars rover, uh, is the first rover since 2012 to attempt to land on the surface of Mars. It's a very difficult thing uh, because, um, uh, well, unfortunately, uh, out of the, the many missions that have been sent to Mars, not all of them have succeeded. So we are all praying for the best today. Um, but here is what uh, is going to be attempted to happen. This, uh, this machine that you see here um, is going to uh, descend with rockets to the surface of Mars. Um, and it is going to let down a cable at the very last minute to let this rover successfully, uh, we hope, uh, touch on the surface very safely and softly. Uh, we know a little bit about Mars, uh, just from what we can see from Earth. Here's a photo by Damien Peach uh, through a telescope in Chile. Um, and uh, this area, this big uh, black triangle is called Sirtis Major. It's one, that, it's one of the really easy things to see through a telescope if you are an amateur observer of Mars. Um, and the rover is going to land right here on the right side of it, on the eastern side of Sirtis Major. On the, uh, because Mars doesn't have continents like Earth, oceans and continents, it helps us make sense of geography on Earth. Um, it, helps to, it helps to go beyond just the images of Mars and to use the topography of Mars, the, um, the height of the Martian surface. So here's a false color picture of Mars where blue is the low areas, red are the highland areas. And you can see that the north part of Mars is really, really low uh, compared to the southern part of Mars. Here's a map of the whole planet. Um, uh, and nowadays, what geologists think is that in ancient times, billions of years ago, billions of the B, there was an ocean on the whole northern part of Mars. Um, and that, uh, that ocean persisted for a long time, possibly. Um, and it was a possible habitat for life. Um, now, uh, with this mission, we're going to be landing right on the edge of that ancient ocean in a place that's called Jezero Crater. Uh, Jezero or Jezero is a Slavic word that means lake in many languages. Uh, so it's appropriate because this is an ancient lake. Um, this big circle here was fed by two rivers, one on the left, one on the right. Um, the Mars rover today is going to try to land on this rover, river right here, the Jezero River Delta. Um, this is a really difficult place to land in. Obviously, if you, if you look at the terrain, it's very, very choppy. There's lots of cliffs and, and obstacles and dangers, but it's scientifically very interesting because this delta um, shows that water flowed here for a long, long time and it gave a possible habitat for life. So here you can see the uh, possible landing site where we hope that the rover will land and the possible path it will travel over the, over the next couple of years as it explores this area, it explores through different layers of geological history of Mars. Um, if you compare this, uh, this river delta to this, uh, it's called the Selenga River in, in Russia or Mongolia, I, I forget which one, it's, uh, it's very, very similar in appearance because Mars and Earth were once very, very similar um, in, uh, in their basic geology. There was a, a thicker atmosphere on Mars. There was a lot warmer on Mars. There's liquid water on Mars. Um, here's an artist's illustration of, of what that watery lake must have looked like billions of years ago. Um, and that gives a rise to the question that there might have been life on Mars. Um, so this rover is going to be looking for fossils, to put it bluntly, or, or just possible other chemical signs that life has existed in the past. Uh, here's some obvious fossils from Earth. So this is what would be really, like here for instance, is an ammonite. Uh, a very classic kind of fossil from hundreds of millions of years ago. It would be wonderful if we could find fossils like this on Mars. 
However, it's not very likely just because we, we haven't seen any so far. And, and this kind of life, the complex life, like, like you and me and ammonites and trilobites and so forth, didn't arise until very late in the history of Earth when Mars had already dried up. Here is what we might hope to find instead. These are called stromatolites. Um, and these are bacteria uh, that grew into great big mats and, um, and over time turned into stone. Here's an example. These, uh, these kinds of animals, they're bacteria and algae. They live today in parts of Australia. Um, and it's possible that something like this existed on Mars billions of years ago. We have no idea. But that is the kind of thing that the Mars rover Perseverance is going to be looking for. Um, so the, the main event today is just to hope that we land safely. There's, there's years of, of science ahead of us if this works out. Um, but uh, we have to get through what's called the seven minutes of terror, uh, which is when uh, the robot first descends through the Martian atmosphere and then lands. And then we have to wait for the signal to travel all the way from Mars to Earth, uh, which will take several minutes. Um, so if you guys are willing and patient and want to stick with me for the next hour, we'll, we'll have a very exciting show to watch. And you can always share thoughts in chat. Um, and then afterwards, if you, if you guys want to have any more questions or if your questions are out, just, just let us know. Thank you. Thank you, William. Okay, um, at the moment, what we'll do is we will um, shift back to the countdown. Um, but before we do so, um, we do have a question. We have mm -hmm. somebody asks, how is, how is that rover being powered over the course of the years? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, of course, uh, to get power on Mars because uh, the other previous rovers used solar power, uh, Spirit and Opportunity use solar power, which is great and available on Mars, but at times there are huge dust storms uh, that sometimes come along and block off the sun for months on end. Uh, this rover is using a very un unlikely uh, source of power for me, it's used plutonium. So it has, a, it has a, a chunk of plutonium on board that gives off heat, which can be turned into electricity and generates about 100 watts of power. Um, and so as long as, as, as that radioactivity lasts, um, it, will, it will have power for a long time. Uh, we have another one. Um, mm -hmm. How will the samples get returned to Earth? Uh, that's a great question. We don't know yet. Uh, they're, they're, uh, what, the, what this rover is going to be doing is going to be collecting samples of rocks and, and soil, gathering them in a, in a safe space that can be found later. Um, and it's hoped that sometime in the next decade, another mission will be launched to Mars that will gather that material, that will, um, that will scoop it up somehow or another and uh, rocket it back to Earth. We, we don't know exactly all the details of that because it hasn't um, been fully worked out, but uh, this is part of the first, first part in a multi-stage uh, effort to bring back samples to Earth. Uh, if you think about it, uh, studying rocks on Mars with a, with a rover on Mars, you, you can learn a lot, but it's only a millionth of what you can learn if you actually could get those samples to Earth to look at them more closely in laboratories here. Okay, um, what we will do is um, we'll shift over. Um, so if we want to um, put it uh, back on screen share, Hunter, that will be wonderful. And then we will uh, commence with watching the uh, countdown. Um, we do have another question or a couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. Does NASA have an expectation for how long the Perseverance rover will operate? Um, and then uh, they state, I remember that an older Mars rover lasted way longer than expected. Oh, well, one. Uh, yeah, uh, um, I know that the, all the Mars rovers that NASA has launched in the past uh, 20 years or so lasted much, much longer than expected. Here in Opportunity, both lasted uh, over a decade. Um, uh, the current uh, occupant of Mars, which is Curiosity rover, has been there since 2012 and is going strong. Um, one problem that Curiosity has had is that its wheels became corroded over time. It's, it's much more difficult to drive around on Mars than people thought. So uh, Perseverance has better wheels. Um, <laughs> so it, it, we, we, uh, we, you can never be sure. A lot of things could go wrong. But based on, the expect, based on the track record NASA has had over the past 20 years, it should last a long time. Let's see. We have. Um, is this is this the is this only a United States mission? Um, well, this is primarily a United States mission run by NASA, but there is always cooperation with different countries uh, when when these kinds of events happen. 
a really basic one is that um, to to get the signals from Mars, we have um, uh, radio telescopes all around the world in Australia and as well as the United States gather those signals so we can hear them. And of course, there are scientists from all over the world who work for NASA and collaborate. Um, there's also going to be a, um, uh, just to let people know, there's also going to be another rover landing on Mars later this year, uh, that, which is the first rover ever launched by China. Um, so uh, that'll be exciting to, to see how that goes. Um, we all hope for the best of that as well. It's, it's obviously a very difficult thing. A lot of other countries have tried to land rovers or probes on Mars and, and not succeeded, but um, the bigger the club gets, the better it is for everyone. There's also a European probe, uh, which should be launched in about two years to land on Mars. Um, we have a question. Uh, are strom are stromatolites uh, closely related to coral? Um, I, I don't think that they're directly related to coral very closely because they're they're actually a lot simpler than coral. Coral is a kind of complex organism that lives in colonies, whereas stromatolites are basically bacteria or algae, um, and they um, they grow in great big mats, and then um, the mats get bigger and bigger and bigger as they try to reach towards the sunlight. Um, so this is one of the earliest kinds of life that we we know exists on Earth. Um, it's in the oldest fossils we have on Earth, um, and if you think about it, it's a kind of a film or um, plaque that kind of grows over time. Um, so it's it's really uh, really kind of primitive life. So th that's just a possibility of what might exist on Mars. We obviously have no idea. We don't know if there's an, ever been able to find Mars at all. <laughs> okay, um, we have another question. Um, what's mm -hmm. technically the monetary cost of a mission of this caliber? Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember. I think it was around two billion with the B dollars, which is a lot, of course. Um, but compared to a lot of other things um, that go on the government. It's, it's, I think I read that the operating course costs of, of the rover this year uh, will be similar to the amount that the Defense Department spends on golf courses, <laughs> maintaining golf courses. So um, it's, a, it's, it's obviously a, an expensive and, and difficult thing, um, but um, it's a, well, we, we hope the scientific results yeah, for us. Okay. So, um, what we could do at the moment, um, mm -hmm. if you want to, um, if you want to close your um, screen share, what we'll do is okay. Hunter. Hunter will switch Perfect. back. There we go. And yeah, I think um, that's what we all want to wait for. And he's queuing up the audio for us, mm -hmm. so we could hear the countdown. On M20 um, probably the last time if you feel the need to do a battery change to do that um, before we go into quiet mode. Um, also, uh, unless we have something updated we want to show in the next couple of minutes, we're about to turn over our WebEx screen to telecom for tones. At that point, I'm happy to get updates um, in chat in our WebEx on EDL Ops, but I'd prefer to not have any more call-outs over the net unless you see something you do not expect. Oh, well, this is TAP3. I have the uh, runout solution for OD135, distance to target, 392 meters. Copy. Feel free to share if you'd like. Level 2, OL1, voice check. Are you five by OL1? Copy. Looks good. Thank you. Tap three. We have a question. Um, are we getting any meteorologic, meteor, meteorological info? And if so, can they alter the landing attempt schedule if they see a dust storm in the way? 
Yeah, so we do have uh, meteorological info so time, um, coming, from, coming from other probes time, that are currently on Mars on or orbiting time. Mars. Will we start our uh, call outs during EDL telemetry? And there's also a uh, United Arab Emirates probe that just arrived at Mars to get meteorological info. Phase two, flight. Go flight. At this time, uh, let's continue our briefing for the rest of EDL. Sure. So uh, after coming out of EDL start, that's our uh, last uh, real reinforcement of the state that the vehicle was in uh, throughout much of cruise and EDL approach. Um, and it's uh, our precursor to making many more radical changes to the state of the vehicle. Uh, Matt Wallace said it well the other day. This is, EDL is kind of like a controlled disassembly of the vehicle. As we go through, we need to uh, uh, get rid of the things we don't need anymore and uh, get ready to put our wheels on the ground. So um, one of the final things that we're doing here uh, is ensuring that our ACS knowledge is uh, top-notch. Um, we depend on ACS to pass an estimate of the uh, vehicle's attitude and uh, rate of change to EDL, and that's our starting point for propagating down to the ground. Um, when we come up in uh, EDL, the EDL prep anchor, uh, is when we'll take our the last state uh, from ACS and we'll be propagating uh, from that point to the ground um, uh, until we get uh, more knowledge from the radar once we turn it on. Um, I can give a high-level overview of some of the events that were that are going to transpire uh, throughout EDL. Um, of course, commentary will be uh, detailing this um, as we go through. Uh, and you'll hear a lot of members of the EDL team uh, calling out uh, specific events as they occur um, and indicators as we see them. But uh, to give everyone an idea of what we're going to see, um, we will first start uh, shortly here. We'll get news that uh, the vehicle has separated the cruise stage uh, since we no longer need that. Uh, we need to prepare for entry into the atmosphere. Uh, after that, we will uh, indeed start the entry process. Um, at this point, uh, we're depending on the heat shield to uh, both protect the spacecraft uh, and uh, help slow us down. Uh, we'll be uh, gathering data from our medley sensors, um, and uh, we'll be decelerating rapidly at that point. Uh, as we make our way through the atmosphere, uh, we'll be firing our uh, DRCS thrusters uh, that are in, that poke out the back of the back shell. Um, and uh, this will allow us to steer our trajectory uh, as we make our way through the atmosphere. Um, and uh, this is one of the things that allowed uh, MSL, the Curiosity rover, um, to uh, um, to land where it did, um, and we're depending on the same type of entry guidance uh, this time around uh, to help get us very close to our target. Uh, as 
we make our way uh, through entry, finish the uh, finish our, our guided entry um, profile, uh, we'll do a maneuver called uh, heading alignment, where we uh, point toward the target uh, and get ready to uh, deploy the parachute. Uh, but th before we deploy the parachute, uh, we need to get rid of a uh, set of balance passes uh, that have been uh, giving us a uh, center of gravity or CG offset um, throughout uh, the guided entry phase. Uh, so these are called the uh, the entry balance masses. We also call this maneuver um, suffer SUFR or straighten up and fly right. Uh, so we'll go ahead and eject those masses uh, when we get uh, a trigger from the GNC system uh, telling us that we're at the appropriate range to the target to do so. As soon as we deploy those, uh, we will uh, no longer have a CG offset, um, and uh, we'll be ready to deploy the uh, parachute 17 seconds later. I'm going to hold here for uh, EO prep as uh, we're about to start that anchor. Copy, phase two. And activity, please call that out when it's ready. Copy, Flip. All stations at this point, let's limit our traffic on the net to critical issues only. Flight EDL com. Go EDL com. As per step 205 in the OCP, uh, we can confirm that MRO has started their first slew. Copy EDL com. EDL prep anchor has begun. We have stopped our AMAN, started the raw DP for EDL, idled the nav filter um, and IVP, and we are now propagating via the DIMU. We've powered on our UHF, but it's not yet transmitting, and the anchor has complete. We expect our ne next anchor to start in two minutes. Copy activity. taking a battery change. Please do back on that.
DHRS vent anchor has begun. Here we are reinforcing the BCB discharge and charge state. We are powering on the pyro firing cards. Flight, we are about 14 minutes from entry interface. The vehicle is currently preparing the heat rejection system that has kept the thermal system cool inside the air shell for about the last six months. This will allow the spacecraft to more easily cut the line in upcoming crew stage separation, which is under four minutes now. We have now enabled the rover Pyro bus. We are powering off the crew stage devices. The vehicle is preparing for the upcoming cruise stage operation in about 3 minutes 15 seconds by powering off all the devices on the cruise stage in order that they can be safe once the cruise stage is jettisoned. We are firing our first pyros to vent the HRS liquid and gas. The HRS vent anchor is complete. We will see the next anchor in approximately three minutes. We are currently 12 and a half minutes from entry interface. We are coming upon cruise stage separation in two minutes and 20 seconds. We're about a minute and a half from cruise stage separation, about 11 minutes, 20 seconds from entry interface. We are switching to the MFSK tones. Telemetry will have stopped. Telecom is confirming that the spacecraft has switched to broadcasting tones. These tones are received directly from Perseverance, but have very limited information content. We won't receive real-time information until about um, t 9, 10 minutes from now, once the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter starts relaying information from Perseverance. We are under a minute from crew stage separation, about 10 and a half minutes from entry interface. We are seeing the heartbeat tones. We are continuing to receive tones from Perseverance, coming standing by for cruise stage separation.
RCS priming. Crew stage up. We have indication that crew stage separation has been confirmed by the spacecraft. In about one minute, Perseverance's landing software will wake up and begin the final preparations for entry. The first action it will do is to fire warm-up pulses with its entry thrusters. These pulses ensure that the spacecraft gets the thrust that it wants during entry interface. We are about nine minutes from entry interface. I have confirmation that uh, we got shadowed by the uh, cruise stage uh, as it uh, passed through our beam to the Earth. Telecom indicated actually that we could see a signal that the cruise stage went between the Perseverance entry capsule and Earth. So we saw a little blip uh, in the data stream Our indicating cruise stage separation. We have confirmation that the vehicle has started warming up those entry thrusters. Warm up pulses have begun. Spin down. At this point, the spacecraft is trying to stop its spin BBM. from the cruise two revolutions per minute down to zero, and then we'll turn to its desired orientation from entry. It will... CTE separate the two balance masks that have kept it balanced during all of cruise. This will allow the entry capsule to have lift when it enters the atmosphere. We have confirmation that the spacecraft has turned to the desired entry attitude. We are about seven and a half minutes from entry interface. MRO points carrier lock. Uh, sorry, MRO. The DTE from uh, Radio Science from uh, Green Bank reports carrier lock. Do you see the carrier on the downlink? Flight level one. We are continuing to wait for entry interface. We're about six minutes and 45 seconds from entry interface. We have confirmation from uh, Greenback that they are receiving direct to Earth telemetry via that path. The spacecraft Perseverance is currently transmitting heartbeat tones. These tones indicate that Perseverance is operating normally and has nothing significant to report. This is as expected. We're currently just over six minutes from entry interface. We are just under, uh, we're about five and a half minutes from entry interface. We're still receiving heartbeat tones. Uh, we expect to continue receiving heartbeat tones until about five minutes after entry. At that time, Perseverance will be no longer in view of our antennas here on Earth. About 90 seconds prior to entry, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter should begin receiving telemetry from Perseverance and streaming it to Earth in near real time. Uh, there are a few expected short outages 
such as when we have a plasma backout or when we enter the peak heating phase. Aside from these outages caused by the plasma blackout, antenna switching, or high dynamic events, spacecraft events, we should have telemetry until about 90 seconds after landing. Uh, a plasma blackout is when the signal from Perseverance isn't strong enough to make it through the superheated, super fast air flowing around the spacecraft all the way down to Earth. Once the temperature drops below that peak heating, we do reacquire the signal from Perseverance. We are currently about four and a half minutes from entry interface. Perseverance continues to report heartbeat tones, indicating everything is nominal. MRO reports the electro radio is powered on, ready to receive signals from the lander. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has reported that it's ready to receive the signals from Perseverance. It should be in a few minutes here. We're just Flight local one. from entry interface. Around this time, a second spacecraft, MAVEN, should begin picking up telemetry from Perseverance and will continue to record that telemetry until several minutes post-landing. We won't get that data for several hours after landing as it's being recorded and then will be forwarded to Earth later. We are continuing to receive heartbeat tones, indicating that everything is nominal. We're currently at about three minutes until entry interface. We are two and a half minutes from entry interface. Perseverance is to transmit heartbeat tones, indicating everything is nominal. We're just under two minutes from entry interface. As it gets closer to Mars, Perseverance is actually being pulled in by gravity and accelerating. By the time Perseverance reaches entry interface point, she should be going just under 5.4 kilometers per second. We're at about 90 seconds from entry interface and standing by for Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to pick up the telemetry. We are one minute from entry interface. MROs are in receive mode. We have confirmation that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is now relaying data from Perseverance. We're about 30 seconds from entry interface. Perseverance is going about 5.2 kilometers per second and is about 190 kilometers altitude above the surface of Mars. Confirm your HF data flow. Uh, seconds. MCWW on. 
5.3 kilometers per second and an altitude of uh, about 150 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Entry. We have confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second at an altitude of about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. The spacecraft is now waiting until it begins feeling the atmosphere of Mars to slow it down. Once there is enough atmosphere, it will start controlling its path to the landing target. Doppler indicates entry into the atmosphere. Navigation is also confirming that we can see a little bit of that slowdown of the atmosphere on the Perseverance entry capsule. Our current velocity is about 5.36 kilometers per second and an altitude of about 67 kilometers from the surface. We are probably seeing MRO plasma blackout at this point. Bank one completed. MRO has lost lock. Probably indicate reversal, bank reversal. We have indications that Perseverance is now performing bank reversals in the atmosphere. These are the steps in order to control its Max diesel, to G's. the landing target. Uh, Perseverance has just passed through the point of maximum deceleration and has indicated that it felt approximately 10 Earth Gs of deceleration. MRO has lock again. Doppler indicate reversal. Bank to complete. We saw a small outage uh, of the UHF telemetry from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter during that peak heating phase likely caused by the plasma blackout. Perseverance is still continuing to perform bank reversals in the atmosphere to control its distance to the landing target. Lovely. Okay. Reversal. End of range control, range minus 1.9 kilometers, cross range minus 2.4 kilometers. Perseverance is going about 1 kilometer per second at an altitude of about 16 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have entered heading alignment, which means Perseverance is no longer trying to control the distance to Mars, but in to the target on Mars, but instead is flying straight to the target. Our current velocity is about 550 meters per second at an altitude of about 15 kilometers from the surface. MRO is reporting good telemetry lock. We are coming upon the Tougher start. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver. GBMD jettison where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicate indicate shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows 
both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Nav filter converge. Velocity solution 3.3 meters per second. Altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. OVS valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. TBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines. Back Our shell set. is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. SDS level. Constant velocity, 104. Accordion. Constant velocity accordion, altitude error. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. We've lost direct to earth tones. Throttle down. Sky can maneuver has started. About 20 meters. Tango off Delta. Orbit. Nominal. We're getting signals from M MRO. Bring me stable. UHF is good. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. At this point, the descent stage has flown away to a safe distance. Perseverance is continuing to transmit direct through Mars reconnaissance orbiter to Earth. reports they're still getting telemetry from the lander. All right. All right, all stations. Touchdown confirmed. We're going to wait for the images. OL3, OL1, you have what you need? OL3, I have what I need. Flight, we have seen the completion of EDL 3000. Copy. Copy activity. That is as expected. <sighs> MRO is still seeing a strong signal from the lander. <sighs> Flight, this is OL3. <laughs> I am uh, ready to share. OL3, you are go. 
Uh, for those on M. All stations, stand by for the images. Yes! Flight, this is OL3. I have uh, the target point on the map when you are ready. We are ready, OL3. Go for it. Flight, I'll be uh, moving in, showing you the safe zone that we've landed in. Flight. T R N T R N. Can we get the uh, cliff image, OL? Activity, this is OL. Can you repeat that request on M20 EDLF? OL, can we get the other image to show the cliff? I'm sorry, say what image again? I'm not understanding. Flight OL3. OL3. Uh, you can see uh, we've landed about uh, 35 meters from the nearest rocks that we could identify from orbit by their shadows. Copy OL3, TRN in action. Yep. <laughs> Take that, Desiree. Woo! Right. <laughs> I remember this spot. It looks good. <laughs> <laughs> Copy OL3. I'm sure that you have seen them all and you recognize them all. So. Reports Electra still in walk with the lander. Flight, we have seen the transition to surface. <laughs> EDL is done. Woo! Yeah. Mm -hmm. Transition to surface. All stations Thank are. You to <laughs> Congratulations, Perseverance team, and the whole team that's not here as well. Excellent job. All stations on M20 EDL Ops, um, we have transitioned to surface as reported downstairs. Uh, if you're part of that surf story to the surface team, make sure you're starting to work those inputs, please. Okay. Well, that was excellent. It was successful, wonderful. We got pictures already, which is great. Um, William, did you did you have any um, uh any any uh, comment remarks or anything? For... Yes, I'm so I'm so excited. I'm so happy. Can you hear me right now? Perfect, loud and clear. Oh, great. Let me turn my uh, let me turn my video on it as well. Yes, I, I'm extremely excited. I'm extremely excited. Um, you, you never know how this is going to go until it goes down, and, and it was a, it seems like it was a perfectly successful uh, landing. Um, so I'm I'm really I'm really really happy so far. <laughs> it seems like it's, it's nothing but good news so far. And we've already got uh, pictures, which which usually takes hours to get those pictures back. It, it happens so quickly. 
I thought it was interesting when they said that they were only uh, 35 meters away from some, some of the rock cliffs. Uh, you know, it's so it's so dangerous when you land on a planet, you, you, you can't see what you're going into. So uh, they, they could have easily had crashed into those rocks and they, and they didn't. So it's something to be really, really happy for. So Mars over the past uh, uh, 20 years or so from different rovers that have landed there before. Uh, the rocks on Mars are, are really cool. If, if you want to check out right now, you can check out some pictures from Curiosity rover, uh, Spirit rover. Uh, you, you can see a lot of the different terrain that we've already explored. But um, if, if you uh, keep your eyes peeled to the news in the next couple of days, you'll be seeing a lot of pictures uh, in full color and in a lot of detail of all, of all the rocks that, in this area. This should be one of the most uh, spectacular sceneries from Mars that we've got. A lot, a lot of the places that we've landed on Mars before ha have been really flat and boring just because we want to be safe. We want to find a safe place to land. This time they deliberately chose a higher risk level so that we can get more, more science out of that. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do also is I'm going to put the link uh, to the Hamptons Observatory in there. Thank you. Uh, it's a great Great website uh, if you want to check that out. Plus, they have um, some events listed on there um, that have taken place. Uh, so, we thank thank the, um, the, the 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 Hamptons Observatory for giving us East Hampton Library the opportunity to host this watch party. And um, I'm also going to put in there. If anyone would like to, to visit um, Canio's books, um, if you're ever in the Hamptons or you're, uh, you you come out to um, Sag Harbor, uh, great bookstore right there in the heart of uh, Sag Harbor, and I'll put that in there for you. Um, yep, I, I just got to say thank you myself uh, to Kenya's books again because they really saved me at the last minute uh, because uh, because of the snowstorm today, I wasn't getting any uh, internet connection at my house. Uh, so that they really came through and I really, really appreciate that. Um, and so, I, of course, I also appreciate East Hampton Library for organizing this, for moderating it, for all doing all the posting this. And I also have to thank the, the people at Hamptons Observatory uh, who organize all these types of events and, and and really keep us all together um, online uh, and looking up at the stars. So thank you so much. And of course, thank you to NASA and JPL uh, for uh, all the incredible work that they do to get this done. This, this is so difficult um, and, and they just do an amazing job. So it's a, it's a wonderful uh, site to keep going to, uh, you know, not just the landing, but, but keep, keep, keep track of what, what goes on in the, in the coming days and weeks as new pictures and, and new discoveries come from Mars. Uh, with my little globe here. This is, uh, oh, let me let me put the video on, of course. Um, so this is, uh, this is a little globe of Mars. This is just about where we landed today. Um, so uh, there's a whole planet here. It's about as much land on Mars as there is on the whole planet Earth. So we've only landed at maybe uh, six or seven different places on Mars. There's so much to explore. There's, there's so much to find out. Um, so keep your eyes peeled in the coming years as we learn more about this, this incredible planet next door to us. Will do, definitely. Thank you, uh, Will, uh, Hampton's Observatory, uh, Canio's Books, and uh, this is Steve Spataro from the East Hampton Library thanking everybody for Zooming in today and uh, watching this um, wonderful uh, touchdown uh, on Mars. And we'll be sure to keep you posted of other events that we're having. Um, and wherever you are and whatever part of the world you're in, have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Um, if you've got some snow where you are, uh, be careful out on the roads. And we wish you all the best. Thank you.